Hey guys, welcome to Bring to Light. In this episode, Camilla and I wrap up our health journeys from the previous episode. We discuss the autoimmune protocol diet, balancing blood sugar, and what we usually eat in a day. Let's get started. Hi, we are going to pick up where we left off from episode one. We talked about my visit to the endocrinologist where I was given advice to eat more bread. Um, I did that, started becoming more anxious around 2020. Stuff going on during that year exacerbated it. Life eventually began to feel more normal, but I was still anxious and developing new symptoms. So Mm -hmm. that's where we're going to pick up. I started feeling really faint while eating breakfast. At that time, we were eating a lot of fast food, Mm -hmm. a lot of breakfast sandwiches, protein waffles, oatmeal, oatmeal, smoothies, smoothies, uh, things that we thought were healthy. Uh, The oatmeal wasn't the packaged oatmeal that you get. It was like steel cut oats. Steel cut oats that were organic, one ingredient. I was using almond milk. I was putting collagen protein in my oatmeal using organic berries. I wasn't Mm -hmm. adding, there was no sugar in the oatmeal, Mm -hmm. but oats are very high in carbs, which our bodies turn into sugar. So uh, I I thought I was eating really healthy by eating Kodiak pancakes, smoothies that were spinach, organic fruits, um, and I was still feeling like crap because Mm -hmm. I was eating really high carb. So that's some good context for the rest of the episode. I was getting really bad panic attacks and I developed a new symptom, which was heart palpitations in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. I would wake up randomly. I couldn't spot a pattern ever um, as to what would make them happen. I'd wake up in the middle of the night My heart felt like it was pumping out of my chest. Sometimes I'd be really hot and I'd rip off my clothes. Sometimes I wasn't hot. Every time that it would happen, it was like one to two minutes max. It was a very short amount of time and I was never fully awake. So Mm -hmm. I had many theories as to what this could be. I thought it could be a nightmare that woke me up and made my heart race. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought it could be panic attacks in the middle of the night but they were always really short and I'd always fall right back asleep immediately. It was never bad enough to where I'd actually wake up. I never knew the time. I never really remembered anything except how I felt. And it was, yeah, pretty scary. So that was a new symptom and it kept happening randomly. And that eventually led me to go see a sleep doctor and a cardiologist. I don't remember which one came first. I think I went to go see a sleep doctor first because a coworker of mine shared with me that she had narcolepsy and I was napping multiple times a day. Yeah. I, I might've suggested that it could have been sleep apnea as well. Yeah. So I think th- maybe those two things together, maybe a combination of those things led to yeah. the sleep doctor. Yeah. Visit. Yeah. Nathan thought that maybe I wasn't breathing well in the middle of the night and that was waking me up and making me feel panic and then making my heart race. Mm -hmm. So I went to go see a sleep doctor first and they did a sleep study on me. I mentioned that I thought it could, I could be experiencing sleep apnea or I could be narcoleptic because I could sleep anywhere, anytime. And my coworker that had narcolepsy had all the same symptoms that I had and was now on this new medication that just completely transformed her life. She didn't nap anymore. She wouldn't fall asleep in weird places anymore. And Mm -hmm. I wanted that for me. So I went to the sleep doctor to see if I was narcoleptic because maybe I was and need some kind of medication to stop being so sleepy all the time and feeling so tired. And they did the sleep study and said that everything was fine. Mm -hmm. Don't have sleep apnea, don't have narcolepsy but they offered me the narcolepsy medicine anyway because I told them my sleep was being really disrupted. Mm -hmm. I thought that was super sketchy because that's some pretty strong stuff that I don't think we should be taking unless we really need to. Um, So that experience wasn't positive for me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I just left frustrated because I still didn't have answers as to why this, I was, my sleep was being disrupted in the middle of the night every now and then. So then that led me to go see a cardiologist And they also did a study on me. They put a halter monitor on my chest. It's this little device that 
monitors your heart rate. I didn't know if an episode was going to happen while I had the halter monitor on. I The study was only a week long. Mm -hmm. So I thought, dang, if it doesn't happen, then they're not going to see that my heart is racing in the middle of the night and they're going to say everything's fine and I just wasted my time and money. Mm -hmm. The cardiologist. Thankfully, an episode did happen while I had the halter monitor on and the doctor called me the next morning and said, hey, we noticed some activity last night on the monitor. I need you to come in as soon as possible. So I went into the doctor's office and I wish Nathan was there with me because maybe he'd be able to help me recall the diagnosis. I kind of just blacked out. Um, but he basically said that I have something wrong with a heart artery um, and that my heart is beating two, two beats per minute, something like, like twice as much as it should be. And there's something wrong with an artery um, and that I need to be put on a beta blocker immediately hmm. and that I need open heart surgery scheduled within the next month. That was wild to me because this these episodes are only happening in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. one to two minutes, confirmed halter monitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not during the day. Not during the not day. Not when you're working out. Not at the gym when we're lifting really heavy. We were seeing a personal trainer at the time that was pushing us pretty hardcore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... <laughs> We were doing great um, at the gym, never had these heart palpitations during the day. And I just really didn't believe this diagnosis. I didn't want that to be my reality. Mm -hmm. I went home and I talked to my friends and family about it because I was pretty spooked. And no one believed it, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Even you, I don't, I don't think you were worried. You were like, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, because <laughs> you asked them some questions and they just totally dismissed you. Yeah, yeah. I said, doctor, do you think it could be a night a nightmare that's waking me up? Do you think it could be a panic attack in the middle of the night? Do you think maybe my blood sugar is dropping? Do you think it mm -hmm. could be anything else? And this dude just said, I'm a cardiologist. I know the heart. I know what I saw on your halter monitor. This is the diagnosis that I'm giving you, and this is the problem. Yeah, let's get you in for surgery in a week. You know, it's and uh, let me put you on a beta blocker yeah. that only 85 year olds that have heart attacks and strokes take. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah, this dude just didn't know me. I'm 25, pretty healthy, besides the fatigue and all the symptoms that we've talked about so far. <laughs> My organs were working well, and I didn't feel like I had any disease or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, now I know that this was all just metabolic dysfunction mm -hmm. due to a poor diet. Another reason that I thought his, that I honestly thought this doctor was a quack because the halter monitor just monitors your heartbeat. It's not a visual representation of what your heart looks like. Mm -hmm. I hadn't done any kind of scan. I, I'm not a cardiologist. So I don't know what procedure would need to be done, but he's never seen my heart. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was kind of crazy that he was, I think he was just making an assumption that there was an artery problem based mm -hmm. off of the rhythm that he detected from the halter monitor. Yeah. Jumping to a, a very dramatic conclusion yeah. with very little evidence. Yeah. Um, so thankfully no one, n no one that knew me well was worried when I told them about this. My family and my friends were like, I don't think it's that. Maybe you should explore something else. So yeah, no, no history of heart disease in your family. No. Yeah. Uh, and I was doing well. I, you know, I imagine if I had a heart problem that I wouldn't be able to lift really heavy at the gym or go on long walks or that maybe my chest would hurt. I imagine that I'd have other symptoms outside of these random, very short one to two, two minute, minute yeah. heart palpitations in the middle of the night that only happen at night. Mm -hmm. So moved on and I don't know how much time goes by after the cardiologist visit, but I started wondering if maybe the pill that I take every day has anything to do with all of these symptoms and how I feel. I'm referring to the birth control pill. I had been on birth control for 12 years at this point. I got on it mm -hmm. when I was 13, got off of it when I was 25 at this point in this story. And no doctor had ever told me, no gynecologist had ever talked to me about what birth control is, what it does to your body. So I just had all these questions and someone that I followed online posted about a documentary called The Business of Birth Control. 
I watched that documentary and it answered all the questions that I had and just opened up my eyes to the truth of what birth control is, what it does, and how it just completely shuts down an entire part of it shuts down your entire female reproductive system Mm -hmm. that is really vital for your overall health Mm -hmm. and hormones. I was taking synthetic hormones and there's no way that this wasn't affecting me negatively. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, now I know after watching that documentary that when you get birth control, when you pick up the little birth control pack from the pharmacy, there's a pamphlet in the back that you can unravel and it's humongous. It's like the size of a road, a road map. It's huge. (laughs) And it's all of the warnings and symptoms that you could possibly get all of the damage that your body could experience from taking this pill. Mm -hmm. And I was on it for 12 years, which definitely burdened my body in many ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm just glad that God gave me the wisdom to think, Hmm, maybe it's, this pill that I take every single day, what is that doing to me? And I'm thankful for documentaries like The Business of Birth Control. If you're a woman and you're on birth control, I highly recommend that you watch it just so that you're aware of what's going into your body. Um, Yeah, it opened up my eyes and made me feel really confident in the decision to get off birth control. And at that time, a lot of my friends were also getting off of birth control because they were questioning if that was what was best for their body. So. I got off of birth control and at that exact same time, I'm pretty sure it was within the same week, I also started seeing a nutritionist, a holistic nutritionist that changed my life and taught me so much of what I know and what we're going to be talking about on this podcast. Like She's responsible for this huge pivot in our life, the diet change, um, just so many good things came from working with her. Um she listened to all of the symptoms that I was experiencing and said, I think you're experiencing blood sugar roller coasters. Mm-hmm. So I want that to be the focus of this episode because after focusing on a diet to stabilize blood sugar, avoid those roller coasters, all of my symptoms went away and your lifestyle also improved, even though you weren't trying to, just by following this diet with me. Yeah, yeah. So let's start with asking the question, what is blood sugar for listeners that might not know what that is? I didn't know what it was until I started working with this nutritionist. Um, Blood sugar is the amount of sugar in our blood. (laughs) It's pretty straightforward. Um, But how does it work? That is a whole other thing. So I'm going to read from an article that I have pulled up from a company called Vary. This company makes a tool called a CGM, a constant glucose monitor. It's a really cool tool for figuring out if the foods that you're eating are causing blood sugar spikes, aka roller coasters, or if your blood sugar is pretty stable throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Um, We can talk about Vary in a second, but I'm just going to read this little paragraph on their website and i'll also link this article about metabolic health and blood sugar in the the show notes later so it says when you eat foods high in sugar your blood glucose levels spike rapidly taxing your pancreas as it produces a large amount of insulin to bring those high glucose levels back down to normal when this is repeated consistently over time your cells may lose their responsiveness to insulin i.e become insulin resistant a condition a condition that affects four out of 10 non-diabetic American adults. Why does this matter? When you have insulin resistance, you tend to have higher than normal levels of circulating glucose even while fasting. As mentioned, fasting glucose levels are one of the five measurements of metabolic health, and when they're out of range, you increase you increase your risk of metabolic health problems and even metabolic syndrome. Mm. So it's um, very taxing on the body. It's very ta- it's very stressful. Mm-hmm. Um, and Other stressful events can cause glucose spikes as well, like a hot shower or a sauna, Mm -hmm. um, a stressful event, an argument, poor sleep Mm -hmm. can cause blood sugar spikes. I'll try to put a picture uh, somewhere on a video, even though this is just audio, so that you guys can see what I'm a visual of what we're talking about. But it's basically a line. And when you're eating really high carb, like I was doing, I was starting my day with a smoothie or oatmeal, which was mostly sugar. Um, 
your glucose goes like way up. So just imagine this line going way up like a roller coaster and it spikes. It's like the peak of a sugar sugar high. Mm-hmm. And when it goes really high, that means it drops way low. So high means you're experiencing hyperglycemia, which you don't usually feel any symptoms from. It's really high and then it goes way down. The roller coaster drops and that's when you experience hypoglycemia. And the symptoms of hypoglycemia are awful and you can feel them and identify them pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So the, the symptoms of hypoglycemia are what I was experiencing years ago when I went to that endocrinologist yep. and I said, I feel like I'm about to pass out. I feel really shaky, anxious. Um, and her advice was eat more bread because that makes the drop go back up. Mm-hmm. And that that is true. Um, but the issue is it goes way back up and then what happens again, it comes way back down. It's mm-hmm. just this constant up, down, up, down, up, down. And when you experience hypoglycemia, those low lows, if you solve the problem with lots of carbs like bread, it's just going to go way up and then come back down. So the solution is not carbs. Mm -hmm. You want it to increase slowly, not dramatically. Yeah. You want rolling hills, Mm -hmm. not roller coasters. Yeah. Yeah. The other, other issue too, when, when your blood sugar starts to drop and your body has experienced those symptoms in the past, it naturally tells you, Hey, I need food. Really what your body is saying is, Hey, I need more sugar because it's trying to mitigate that that, that, drop. that drop. so Which feels awful. It feels like it you're going to pass out. It feels awful. And it leads you to constantly snack, particularly on high carb snacks. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I was doing for years. I'd feel really faint. And so I'd drink some orange juice or I'd eat even like a Snickers bar or something because that would bring me back to life and make mm-hmm. me feel like when I was experiencing the blood sugar crashes, I remember telling Nathan, I literally felt like I was dying. It felt like someone was taking a vacuum and sucking all of the energy, all the life out of me. It was Mm -hmm. really intense. Mm -hmm. Um, And I hope that none of you have ever experienced this because it's awful. Um, And the only thing that would help was sugar. And so I'd eat the sugar and then I'd be like, ooh, I'm back. Like Mm -hmm. I feel really, really good. Um, But then it just kept happening again and again. So I'm really thankful that my nutritionist taught me what blood sugar is um, and that I became aware of it. And so that led, she told me to get a CGM Mm -hmm. back to this company called Barry. And there are a lot of CGMs on the market. There's a really popular one called Levels Mm. that's very similar to Barry. Um, This tool is really cool. It's this little patch that you put on the back of your arm and it's this little plastic filament um, it looks like a, a needle. It's not, mm-hmm. but it is sharp and it, it goes into your arm and it stays there for a month mm-hmm. um, or however long you want to pay for the subscription. And that little filament is in your blood. And so it's constantly testing where your blood sugar is at, kind of like a little finger pricker that diabetics use. Mm-hmm. Um, Way more comfortable than a finger pricker <laughs> because y- yeah. you don't have to do it. Well, constantly. you don't feel anything. Um, yeah, while exactly. it's on you, exactly. just the initial putting the patch on and it doesn't hurt. It's a little plastic thing. So you have that on your arm and every time that you eat a meal, you scan your phone to the little patch mm-hmm. and the app tells you how that food is being processed. Um, mm-hmm. how your glucose is, res- your metabolic system is responding to it. Yeah. You're supposed to scan it throughout the day. And you can mm-hmm. see how you, how your body reacted to different events throughout the day. So mm-hmm. within the app, you can also record a workout you did or every meal you had or even a hot shower. And you can see how your body reacts to all those different stressor events. Mm-hmm. And a glucose response is normal. Mm-hmm. Anytime that you eat, anytime that you do anything, your glucose is fluctuating throughout the day. Mm-hmm. You just don't want it to be dramatic. That's when... That's a red that's a red flag. That means that your body is in stress all day long and your pancreas is working overtime mm-hmm. to release this insulin. Yeah, there there are a ton of a ton of bad things that occur when you're dealing with glucose spikes. Um, one is hormone imbalances in both men and women. I think I've made it pretty clear why you don't want to have mm. high highs and low lows um, because you'll feel terrible. Like I was feeling, you'll feel really fatigued, headaches, uh, anxious, shaky, brain fog. You, you just, hunger. you'll feel like you're barely 
living. Mm-hmm. Like you're just surviving. You're just like getting by is what I felt like. And the only thing that would make me feel better was food. So I was constantly eating. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to eat a bag of chips and then I'd feel good. And then 30 minutes later, I'd feel terrible. So I eat another snack and I'd feel good. And then I'd, it was just up and down and up and down. Um, so you don't want glucose spikes for many reasons. It causes hormonal ba- imbalances in both men and women. Um, it causes headaches, probably related to hormone imbalances, fatigue, brain fog, anxiety. It leads to cardiovascular disease. It interrupts your sleep, especially when you're eating mm-hmm. really high, high carb late at night uh, or really heavy meals late at night. It just completely disrupts everything mm-hmm. if it's if your body, if your metabolic system can't handle the foods that you're eating. Mm-hmm. Back to very, really quick. The cool thing about this tool is that it'll show you how, how your body is responding to certain foods. So thanks to very, I was able to see that the smoothies and the oatmeal that I was eating were causing the glucose spikes. Even they didn't have any additives, no added sugar, they were still very high carb. Mm-hmm. This is the ratio of protein and fat and carbs is really important. So mm-hmm. I strive, we both strive to eat foods that are higher in protein or fat and lower carb. Yep. Um, it, the order in which you eat your food is really important as well. Um, there's a an influencer called Glucose Goddess that speaks about all of this. If you resonate with any of the symptoms that I had and you think that you might be having blood sugar roller coasters, I would check her out. Um, She's a great resource. She has tons of videos and is on tons of podcasts. So she can speak about this stuff really well. I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you what I experienced. And um, the tool that I used that opened up my eyes to the foods that my body couldn't process. And um, I cut those foods out. And we changed our diet thanks to this nutritionist. And all of the symptoms went away Mm -hmm. just by diet change. Back to glucose spikes causing hormonal imbalances. When I changed my diet, I experienced my first ever pain-free period, which Mm. was super cool. So before, when we were eating normally, um, standard American diet, I my periods weren't regular, even though I was on birth control and I'd usually be in a lot of pain. I'd feel a lot of cramps, a lot of fatigue. I'd experience PMS. I'd be really angry or really sad while I was on my period. And I thought that was normal. Mm -hmm. That is not normal. It is very common, unfortunately. And I think it's because a lot of women aren't focusing on balancing their blood sugar. So once I started doing that, my first period after changing my diet was amazing. I Mm -hmm. felt so happy the entire period. I had no pain, no cramps, no brain fog. I wasn't sleepy. I was still able to live my life normally. My diet has changed a little bit since then. (laughs) I'm not as strict. And so every now and then I still experience some fatigue during my period, but I don't beat myself up over it. I just rest and lean into it. Mm. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that diet was? Yes. Um, yeah, that's like the number one question that all of our friends and family ask. They're like, what do you eat? What do you? Mm-hmm. What is your diet? And I do want to preface with this diet works for us. Mm. It's actually, it's evolved over time. Yeah. As even between Camilla and I, we both have slightly different diets. Mm-hmm. Really just doing what we found works best for our own bodies. Mm-hmm. Nathan can eat higher carb than I can. And I think it's because he's a man and he has more muscle. um, And maybe his metabolic system is healthier and more flexible than mine because he wasn't on birth control for 12 years. Mm. He didn't take a whole bunch of antibiotics growing up like I did. Um, There are just a lot of things. You know, he doesn't have to menstruate every month, which is really stressful on the body. Um, So I think... We've seen from tools like the CGM that Nathan can tolerate a higher carb than I can. Mm-hmm. So I just go a little lower carb than he does. But overall, we just try to eat whole foods. Yeah. Do you want to talk about um, the diet that Harry recommended? We can talk a little bit about autoimmune protocol, what it is, and then kind of how we've evolved into our current diet. Yeah. My nutritionist recommended that I follow a diet called autoimmune protocol, AIP, um, to just reduce inflammation in the body because it was really clear that I was experiencing a lot of that. I had really bad bloating, indigestion. I was constipated. I'd poop once a week, maybe. 
I was having a lot of headaches, like I mentioned, poor sleep. Like It was just clear that my body was inflamed in many ways. Mm -hmm. I couldn't think straight. So the headaches, my brain maybe was, I don't know if brain inflammation is a thing, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) probably. Um, So she recommended that I do this diet to reduce inflammation. And AIP is pretty strict. I don't recommend that someone does it unless unless you really want to. I found joy in doing it because I felt really good and I wanted to get rid of all of these symptoms. I just wanted to solve the problem. The diet is not meant to be long-term. It's supposed to be short, one month, two weeks, however. I did it for one month and that was a great reset. It's a great way to figure out what foods your body likes and doesn't like. So the diet pretty much eliminates anything that could cause inflammation. So you can't have eggs, you can't have dairy, no cheese, no seeds, no nuts, no legumes, no Mm -hmm. nightshades, which are a group of vegetables that includes bell peppers, tomatoes, eggplant. Um, I don't know what else. There's a long list of things that you can't have on AIP. You you can't have any food colorings, gums, additives, Mm -hmm. Uh, any kind of refined sugar. Mm -hmm. You can have sugar that is natural in limited quantity, like maple syrup, honey, coconut sugar. You can have fruit, of course, but you should limit it. It shouldn't be a large part of your meal because glucose spikes. Um, So you're really just focusing on nourishing your body with fruits, veggies, and high quality meat. Mm -hmm. So I focused on eating a lot of red meat, grass-fed, grass finished beef, steak, lamb, pasture raised chicken that's organic, um, local, best from a regenerative farm if you can find that. Mm. I focused on organic or local veggies from a regenerative farm that aren't nightshades. So Mm. broccoli, carrots, squash, Um, I also made sure to cook all of my veggies because cruciferous veggies, when raw, can cause a lot of digestive discomfort. So, A lot of bloating. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. I cooked all of my veggies really well and fruit. And Mm -hmm. I I did AIP for a month. The first week was really hard for me Mm -hmm. because I'm a big sugar addict. Mm -hmm. Like a cupcake a day was a thing for me for a long time. Um, so much like I'd crave it in the middle of the night and make Nathan drive to the gas station. Mm, or the, cupcake, <laughs> the cupcake ATM. Or the cupcake ATM <laughs> at the domain. Yeah, when we lived in central Austin. Um, so this was really hard for me to cut out all processed food and just focus on meat, veggies, and fruit. But I did it. And after the first week, I wasn't grumpy anymore. And I started feeling really good. Mm-hmm. All of my symptoms went away. No more chronic fatigue. No more naps, which that is something that I stopped being thankful for and I need to be grateful for Mm because I just, I forgot what that life was like. I slept at least two times a day and throughout the night. I'd sleep like 10 or 11 hours at night. I don't know how I functioned, how I had a job or how I had relationships, (laughs) but I was just, I was always asleep. So I changed my diet. All of that went away. I'm awake all day now, mm-hmm. which is wild. I'm normal now. I was like, wow, this is this is what everyone feels like. This is crazy. <laughs> My panic attacks completely went away. Thank God. Mm-hmm. No more headaches. I remember we used to keep a bottle of ibuprofen on our coffee table, mm-hmm. and I would just pop those mm-hmm. every other day like it was nothing. Uh, I felt so good that I even stopped seeing my therapist. Mm-hmm. Um that's just, that's crazy. So um, I was on a high from AIP. Part of AIP after the month of doing the diet, you introduce one new thing that isn't allowed on the diet once a week afterwards. So after the 30 days was over, the first thing that I introduced was chocolate because Mm -hmm. I just couldn't wait to have chocolate. I got some dark chocolate and I ate it and I felt great. No reaction. Um, and then the next week I tried eggs because I love eggs and it was so hard to eat breakfast without eggs. Mm-hmm. Um, my body felt a little weird with the egg, but I love eggs. So I kept eating it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I tried rice and you get the gist. You continue incorporating foods, uh, 
one a week one a week and you have to be re- you have to pay really close attention to how it makes your body feel mm-hmm. i realized that night shades are no no for me so anytime i had eggplant i would just feel really strange it's hard to describe but the eggplant was just like in my mouth and my body felt off like this it felt like this is poisonous to me mm-hmm. and so i don't eat eggplant and i limit i don't eat bell peppers i'll still eat tomatoes if they're cooked um, like in a tomato soup or something, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But it it was a really cool diet to reset and try foods for the first time again after 30 days and see how those foods may, make me feel. Mm-hmm. Um, and the best part was that all of my symptoms went away by just changing up what I ate. You should also talk about how the diet affected you. Nathan didn't do AIP, but his diet did clean up a lot with us shopping for AIP because we were no longer buying processed food. We weren't buying protein waffles. We weren't Mm -hmm. eating smoothies or oatmeal anymore. We were just eating whole foods, one ingredient foods. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing a lot of the cooking for both of us. And so I followed mostly, but still ate some things that I enjoyed outside of the AIP diet. I mentioned in the last episode that through COVID and working a desk job, I had gotten kind of into a funk and we were eating a lot of fast food that kind of, that led to me gaining quite a bit of weight after switching to autoimmune protocol. I lost about 35 pounds <laughs> yeah. pretty quickly yeah. and with, within a few months. I didn't even notice because I live with Nathan. We are together all the time. And so he never looked larger to me or skinnier. Even when you lost the weight, I didn't notice. It yeah. was when we started seeing our family members that they'd be like, oh my gosh, Nathan's so skinny. Did something change? And <laughs> I didn't notice. And I guess you started checking your weight um, mm-hmm. at the gym and you realized that you lost an insane amount of weight. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that one was really big, but also the brain fog completely went away. I was able to work throughout the whole day and not feel that slump that I used to feel right after lunch. Um, was able to focus throughout the the entire day, which was great. And just way higher energy in general, able to wake up earlier, mm-hmm. get going quicker. That part was really nice. Yeah. Along with changing our diet, we were also on a mission to kind of transform our lifestyles because we were tired of feeling this way. Mm-hmm. So there were other things that we did that helped as well. I think nutrition was a huge one that changed how we felt pretty quickly, like within a week, but we were focusing on other things like strength training at the gym. We were learning a lot about the importance of good sleep, sleep hygiene. Those are things that we'll talk about in other episodes. That's, Mm -hmm. those are the many whys behind this podcast. Those are all of the habits that changed our lives. We're going to share with you guys. Um, but I, I think we should wrap this up. Maybe I'm feeling this way. I don't want to feel this way. How do I balance my blood sugar? Yeah, I think you mentioned ratios a little bit. It's really important to focus on high, higher protein and higher fat meals. Mm-hmm. So on your plate, probably aim for closer to 40% protein and 40% fat. And then if you're going to have carbs as well, that's the other 20%. Start with eating your protein and fats. Yeah, make sure you're eating your carbs at the end because yeah. that's going to help slow the roll of that um, that glucose spike. Mm -hmm. I think one other really key thing that we haven't mentioned yet is there's another amazing way to slow that glucose spike, which is go for a walk after you eat a meal. So about 10 or 15 minutes after you finish eating your meal, go for a walk. I think within the hour after is what you want to do. As early as possible, the better. Once you're done eating, go for a walk around the neighborhood and there's way more benefits there, but it will also, uh, help lower that that glucose spike. Mm-hmm. I think you want to aim for at least 10 to 15 minutes. 30 minutes is even better, mm-hmm. but any kind of exercise. And if you can't go for a walk, I don't know, pick up your dog or your child or some lift them a couple of times after you eat your meal. The, the point is you want to use that energy. What Nathan was saying about the, the plate, what I like to do specifically for breakfast, I would start there. If you think that you might be experiencing blood sugar roller coasters, I would first focus on eating a good breakfast Mm -hmm. and making it as low carb as possible, which I know is so hard in a culture where we eat Starbucks and muffins and breakfast sandwiches for breakfast, oatmeal, cereal, Mm -hmm. all of those things are all carb. They don't have any protein or fat in them. Maybe they do, but it's very low compared to the carb amount. So if I were you, 
um, that this is what helped both of us. This has made all of our symptoms go away was eating protein and fat for breakfast. So a typical breakfast for us, it looks very similar every day. We eat avocado, we eat blueberries, kiwis, um, fruits that are very low in sugar. Our plate usually looks like a fried egg or some scrambled eggs. Also, I want to say that there's a huge misconception about eggs being a good source of protein. Mm. Eggs are pretty low in protein. I think one egg is about six grams of protein. Yeah, I think that's right. You'd have to eat a lot of eggs to get a good amount of protein. Mm -hmm. We still eat eggs in the morning because they're delicious and they're so good for you. So eat eggs, but also make sure that there's another source of protein on your plate. Mm -hmm. So we usually do eggs and then we'll usually do a side of pasture-raised regenerative pork or turkey meatballs, chicken meatballs, beef sausage, chicken sausage. We'll talk about the quality of those things in another episode, but get the best quality that you can get at your grocery store or at your farmer's market, even better. Um, So eggs, some sort of meat. We sometimes even do turkey bacon. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we'll add some fat. So that could be coconut yogurt or whole avocado or some avocado slices. And then for our carb source, we'll do our berries or a kiwi or an orange or some apples or whatever. It's usually fruit. Mm-hmm. So we don't eat a lot of bread because it's pretty high carb. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't eat bread. If you think that it is making you feel this way, I highly recommend a CGM. That will confirm if the bread is causing a spike or not. Mm-hmm. For me, a bread, a piece of bread um, or pasta spikes my glucose and makes me really tired. So I stay away from it. And when I do eat a plate, I, like I described what we eat every morning, I feel amazing. I feel satiated throughout the day. I'm never hungry in between meals. I don't need to snack. Yeah. Our desire for snacking went away completely yeah. when we started prioritizing protein and fat for breakfast in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly you want to try to do that for every meal, mm-hmm. but if you have to pick one, breakfast is the one to do it. Lately, we've been eating burgers for breakfast mm-hmm. and it's been so good. Um, Nathan's just been making us some grass fed, grass finished burger patties with some raw cheddar on the top and a side of sweet potato. No bun, obviously, but it's still so good. Mm-hmm. That's what we eat for breakfast. Sadly, there aren't like that many varieties. You know, we can't, it's not like I can have cereal for breakfast or oatmeal or a smoothie or an acai bowl. We used to have those all the time. I I treat them as a special occasion. Mm -hmm. Um, So if I want an acai bowl, I'll make sure that I have a fat steak or Mm -hmm. (laughs) something really high protein, high fat beforehand. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of you listening might, be a little weird about me saying high fat, high protein, or, Mm. you know, eat a lot of red meat. Um, I know doctors in our world and Western medicine promotes that red meat is bad for you. Butter and fat are bad for you. Mm. We'll go into all of that later. Our testimonies, this episode is proof that real foods like steak and butter aren't bad for you. And they're for us responsible for, why we are where we are today. And we've confirmed with extensive blood labs that we are really healthy and above optimal health. Mm. Um, Through this blood work, we actually got our biological age calculated. And I'm really proud of this because it's just super cool to see. So through this company that we do blood work with, they take all of your blood labs and they calculate what your biological ages. Mm -hmm. So based on your health. So my chronological age right now is 26, but based on all of my labs, my fasting insulin, my liver, my kidney, my cholesterol, all of these things, they calculate them together and they give you a biological age. My biological age is 15, Mm. which is super cool. I'm really young (laughs) metabolically. And what's yours? Mine's 18. Nathan's 18. Um, and he, <laughs> I'm 29. He's 29. <laughs> so that's proof that our diet and these foods are really good for us. They're nutritious. Um, again, I don't know everything. I'm just sharing what has helped me in hopes that it will help you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
It's good. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Thanks well, for tuning in. Yeah, that was a lot. Hopefully it was easy to digest. <laughs> we'll go much deeper on the meat and fat. Yeah. Uh, I think in, that's in a, a good in another episode. So yeah. stay tuned. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we'll catch you in the next one. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'll leave any articles related to what we talked about in the show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye guys. Until next time.